Hi, I'm Stuart Onan. This is my new book, Henry Himself. I'm going to read the very beginning of it. The epigraph is from the haiku poet Busson. The autumn wind on its way sets a scarecrow dancing. This first section of Henry Himself is called In Memoriam. His mother named him Henry, after her older brother, a chaplain killed in the Great War, as if he might take his place. In family lore, the dead Henry had been a soft-hearted boy, a rescuer of stranded earthworms and fallen sparrows, presaging his vocation as a saver of souls. Salutatorian of his seminary class, he volunteered for duty overseas, sending home poems and charcoal sketches of life in the trenches. The church, the stained glass window that showed a barefoot Christ carrying a wayward lamb draped about his neck like a stole, was dedicated in loving memory of the right Reverend Henry Leland Chase. The mock Gothic inscription so elaborate had verged on illegibility. And each Sunday, as they made their way to their pew up front, his mother would bow her head as they passed, as if to point out once more his uncle's saintliness. When he was little, Henry believed he was buried there, that beneath the cold stone floor of Calvary Episcopal, as below the medieval cathedrals of Europe, the noble dead moldered in cobwebbed catacombs, and that one day he would be there too. When Henry was eight, his mother enrolled him as an altar boy, a vocation for which he betrayed no calling, picking at his nails inside his billowy sleeves through the weighted silences and turgid hymns, afraid he'd miss his cue. He had nightmares of arriving late for the processional in his baseball uniform, his cleats clicking as the holy conclave paraded down the aisle. The cross was heavy, and he needed to stretch on tiptoe with a brass taper to light the massive Alpha Omega candle. Funerals were the worst, held Saturday afternoons when all of his friends would be at their secret clubhouse deep in the park. The grieving family huddled beside the casket, praying with Father McNulty for the repose of their loved one's soul. But once the service was done and the candles snuffed, the funeral director took charge, bossing around the pallbearers like hired porters as they lugged the box down the front steps and slid it into the hearse. Invariably, Henry pictured his uncle, his nose inches from the closed lid, on a train crossing bomb-pocked French farmland, or in the dark hold of a ship, cold water gliding by outside the thin steel skin of the hull. He had so many friends and well-wishers, the story went, that the visitation in their grandparents' front parlor, where his sister Arlene taught Henry to play heart and soul on their Baldwin, lasted three days and nights. Arlene was named after Arlene Connolly, his mother's favorite singer, which Henry thought unfair. To avoid confusion among company, his mother called him Henry Maxwell and his uncle Henry Chase, a nicety her side of the family dispensed with, christening him Little Henry. Henry, though not one to make a fuss, would have preferred a nickname of his own choosing, something rough and masculine like Hank or Huck. He thought little Henry was bad luck, and in private moments, rooting through his father's workbench in the cellar for a spool of kite string, or of a rainy day, hiding from Arlene in the lumber room beneath the eaves, or after midnight, climbing the boxed back stairwell with a filched sticky bun, he felt watched over by a ghost neither kindly nor malevolent, merely a silent presence noting his every move like a judge. His mother never said precisely how his uncle had died leaving Henry with a child's dire imagination to picture in a flash a German shell catapulting a rag doll of a doughboy through the air, scattering his limbs over a cratered no-man's land, one arm caught in a coil of barbed wire, the hand still clutching a small gold cross. On his mother's dresser, in a silver frame that captured fingerprints, surrounded by other less interesting relatives from before Henry was born, stood a bleached Kodak of her brother on the dock at Chautauqua, proudly holding up a glistening muskie. Each time Henry snuck into his parents' bedroom to puzzle over this snapshot as if it were a clue to his future, he remarked that the fish, like his uncle, was long dead, while the dock and cottage were still there at the water's edge, awaiting them every summer like a stage set. But exactly how these facts were related, he couldn't say, only that he felt vaguely guilty looking at the young and happy, not yet reverend Henry Chase, as if he'd stolen something from him.
Thank you.